Good afternoon. My name is Ian McLean. I'm the President and CEO of the Greater Kitchener Waterloo Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you and our viewers on Rogers Cable 20, and thank you all for taking the time to be here today for this provincial election candidate forum. The Greater Kitchener Waterloo Chamber of Commerce takes its role very seriously as a community partner and advocate for not only our businesses, but the broader business community and our community as a whole. We work closely with our policy committees at the Chamber, community partners like the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region, the Chamber Healthcare Recruitment Council, and our post-secondary institutions on issues and um, uh, issues and, and uh, important economic prosperity items re relevant to our community. As a chamber, we work with our MPPs th that our community does elect. These forums are an important opportunity to hear directly from those that hope to represent us. Today's event is a great forum for our prospective representatives to talk about the issues that are impacting our members, our business community more broadly, and our community. We want to thank our partners who are supporting this important series. Rogers TV, uh, CLAC, Union Gas, and our partners at 570 News. And I want to thank in particular Jeff Pickle from the News Department for agreeing to be our moderator for this, for this series. And with that, I hand it over to Jeff to take care of the questioning. Once again, welcome and thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Ian. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for attending. Uh, welcome everyone here to the Waterloo Police Association facility, and a special welcome to our audience viewing on Rogers Waterloo region. This is our first of four candidate forums organized by the Greater Kitchener-Waterloo Chamber of Common, uh, Commerce in advance of the June 7th provincial vote. The debate for Kitchener-Conestoga will be held tomorrow at the Woolwich Memorial Centre, followed by the Waterloo debate. That's going to happen Wednesday at Rim Park, and the final forum will be held Thursday for the Kitchener Centre riding. That's going to take place at the Victoria Park Pavilion. The format for the event will be start with 90 second introductory remarks from each candidate, followed by questions in priority areas identified by the uh, Greater Kitchener Waterloo Chamber of Commerce. Those portfolios are jobs in the economy, education, healthcare, municipal services, accountability. The questions will be asked in rotation, and the moderator reserves the right to terminate answers when appropriate. And I think uh, given the conversation I had earlier, given around the three minute mark is, uh, is about the uh, time limit, roughly the time limit for uh, each answer. Also, after all four candidates have uh, answered a particular question, the candidate can ask for a rebuttal on the comments made by one of the other three. Again, the moderator reserves discretion on whether to allow the rebuttal and also to, determinate, to uh, terminate the discussion when required. At the conclusion of the debate, each candidate will be allowed one minute for closing remarks, which will proceed in the reverse order uh, from the opening remarks. We have just, uh, we will now commence with the 90 second open opening remarks. The candidate's order was determined just a few moments ago. We'll begin with David Weber of the Green Party, then go to Fitzroy Vanderpool of the NDP, Amy Fee of the Pro Progressive Conservatives, and finally, Sarika Shinoy of the Liberal Parties. Uh, without any further ado, uh, David Weber of the Green Party, you have 90 seconds. Thank you for giving us your time to look into our party platforms, get to know your candidates here. Uh, my name is David Weber, Green Party candidate for Kitchener South Hespler. I've been a police officer for 30 years, and many of you will know that I ran four years ago for the Green Party as well. At that time, I took an unpaid leave of absence to, to uh, try to represent you. I'm doing it again now with having just recently retired uh, at the end of April. Uh, one thing that I noticed in my policing career the 30 years is that every party has had a majority government that's been sitting here at the table with me. And I have not seen any real improvement dealing with treatment and assistance for those that need mental health help, affordable housing, dealing with poverty, dealing with drug addiction. These are all things that I dealt with about half of every police day, responding to calls for service for people that were in need that I wasn't able to help. It became very disheartening and I tell you, I wanted to help these people. 
and I see what needs to be done to make a difference in citizens' lives, and I know that the best way for me to be able to serve them and to help them is to do it as a member of provincial parliament, to change things in the system so that the quality of life can actually improve for our community members. Thank you. Okay, uh, going second, we'll have Fitzroy Vanderpool from the NDP. I'd like to uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce, uh, 57 News, and everybody involved who helped put this together. It's a great idea to uh, let us all hear the parties and not their platforms. My name is Fitzroy Vanderpool, and I'm running for the NDP in the Kitchener South, Hesper. And, um, you know, my family immigrated to Kitchener Waterloo over 40 years ago uh, in search of a better way of life. And I'm thankful we, situated, we settled in Kitchener Waterloo. Uh, my father uh, took my oldest brother who was getting picked on as a kid, a young immigrant, uh, up to the Waterloo Regional Boxing Academy to learn how to defend himself. And we learned discipline, self-respect, self-control through boxing, which I'm thankful for. I run a business in uh, Kitchener Waterloo, small business I've been running for 15 years. And uh, I have a nonprofit organization that I run called Whip It, With Hope It's Possible Youth in Transition. And it works with underprivileged and uh, at risk youth, teaching them life lessons and life skills. So I'm very happy to be able to impact the community that way. Um, for the youth, the youth are the future of tomorrow. So we need to make sure that we have proper leaders to teach them how to go forward in this life, be champion citizens. As a retired professional world champion, I know what it took for me to become, become a champion boxer, to bring back the first professional world title back to the city. And it's those same features, dedication, hard work that I'm going to use as an MPP for the people of Kitchener South and Hespler. Uh, my platform, the NDP, when I came to the ND NDP, it was the healthcare system that made me want to passionately pursue the NDP because they have a health care and pharma care they wanted for all ages. Um, and I think that's very important. People, health care is a right. And I think that that's what we should understand. So I look forward to your support June the 7th for a better, better, fairer, more prosperous Ontario. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fitzroy. And uh, third, we'll have Amy Fee from the Progressive Conservative Party. Well, thank you, Jeff, for being here today and for moderating for us and for the Chamber for hosting this important debate. Again, my name is Amy Fee, and I'm your Ontario PC Party candidate in Kitchener, South Hespler. I'm running because something I hear quite often is how unaffordable life has become for hard-working families in our region. They're finding it increasingly difficult to get by with the rising cost of gas, hydro, childcare, and everything in between. These families tell me they are looking for real relief from out of control costs and change that will help them create a brighter future for their kids. The Ontario PC Party is committed to bringing real change. That's why we are focused on our five priorities that will help people across Ontario. We will clean up the hydro mess by lowering the rates. We will put money back in the pockets of families by lowering taxes and reducing government waste. We will bring good jobs back to Ontario by supporting small businesses, which will allow them to create jobs. We will fix our health care crisis and put an end to hallway health care. And we will restore trust and accountability in our government. While the NDP and the Liberals have committed to adding billions of dollars to our deficit, an Ontario PC party government is the only government that will respect your hard-earned tax dollars and bring relief that will help hard-working families and give them what they've been so desperately asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And finally, uh, Sarika Shinoy from the Liberal Party. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the Greater uh, Kitchener-Waterloo Chamber of Commerce for having us today. It's a pleasure to be here. We just got back from another debate. I, it's amazing, and I enjoyed the uh, conversations with the audience as well as listening to your concerns. My name is Rika Shinoy. I'm the Liberal candidate from Kitchener South Hespler. I grew up in India and came to Saskatchewan 28 years ago in pursuit of uh, education for a better life. Uh, I moved to this region uh, 23 years ago, and I've lived in all the three uh, cities here. 
uh, I did my MBA and I came here uh, and moved into the banking industry looking after the small business portfolio for TD Bank. I do understand the concerns of small businesses and I'm willing to hear and work with you. I just want to let you know, I came from a family of girls where uh, girls were considered a liability. It was the forward thinking of my parents that encouraged us to go forward and do what we wanted to do. And I, since then, I entered a field of uh, engineering where girls weren't considered fit to be in that field. Since then, I've broken barriers for, and fought for a fair and inclusive society. I believe in uh, uh, everyone having the right to a fair and opportunity and an inclusive place. Um, on June 7th, I want to ask you guys to support me based on my f record of integrity. I'm not afraid to stand up for what's right. I believe in uh, speaking up, and I want you to know that you can believe in me to be there for you on June 7th and after at Queen's Park. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will now get into the question and answer uh, part of the debate. So we will start again with the um, second person in line. We'll start with uh, Fitzroy <coughs> Vanderpool, and then we'll continue with this order uh, through the rest of the day. Concluding remarks, again, will go in reverse order when the questions have finished. So the first topic is about uh, municipal legislation. Provincial legislation has created a situation where the region of Waterloo cannot openly tender construction projects to all qualified contractors and their workers. This is costing tax pay taxpayers from 10 to 30 percent more on projects and not allowing full participation on projects. We have a strong construction routes and employers in this region that are currently prohibited from bidding on or performing work if elected the question is, if you, if elected, will you commit to changing the definition in provincial legislation of who should be considered as a construction employer? Again, this question goes to Fitzroy Vanderpool from the NDP to begin. Good, good question. Um, thank you. Um, I think you know, like the NDP, the NDP is li willing to listen uh, to the Auditor General on to our Auditor General's recommendations. I think that, you know, as far as the, the construction, I mean, uh, the construction is something we we're going through right now, and we need to, um, you know, uh, have a consultation as far as the proper way to get things done. Um, we're looking at, the NDP is looking to restore 50% of funding for municipal transit for improvements to services and more affordable fares. We'll make sure the most important transit projects in our communities get built. And through the construction of our infrastructure, we can create good jobs and stimulate our local economy. So, you know, yes, we need to consult with others and we need to have this as a project that will not exclude anybody so we can have all the voices heard uh, so we can properly get things done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now to uh, Amy Fee from the Progressive Conservatives. Thank you, Jeff, for that question. And absolutely, I am someone that has been long advocating for fair and open tendering in Waterloo Region. It is something that does not respect taxpayers at all. It is something that where our tax dollars are not getting used wisely when we don't have fair and open tendering. When this restriction came in, we went down to 15 possible bidders for construction jobs from 91. We need to have fair and open tendering so that way we have open competition that respects our tax dollars and brings down the cost of work in our region. Thank you. Okay, and next, uh, Srika Shinoi from the Liberal Party. So open and fair tendering. If uh, I had a conversation with the Chamber of Commerce in Cambridge, and this is one of the conversations we had at length. It's absolutely, there's a loophole in the um, act, and that's something we are continuing to have conversations with the community and the tradespeople. So uh, I was uh, reiterating the point that we didn't do, we did something intentionally is wrong. Uh, the committees were uh, established, studied, and uh, sometimes uh, some things get overlooked. This, uh, the Liberal Party is open to understanding that there was a loophole, and we are working with the parties to address that. So that's something I want to make sure everyone understands that. Thank you. Thank you. And moving lastly on this question to David Weber from the Green Party. I remember this question being raised four years ago. and in those four years that the Liberals say that they're willing to open up and look at this issue, they haven't. Um, 
the fairness and tendering needs to be addressed. Everyone needs to be able to have equal opportunity to be able to apply and get contracts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We now have a, a chance to rebut. If uh, there is anything, anyone here who would like to do that, um, or otherwise we can move on. So we'll give the floor. Uh, no, we are okay. Okay, we'll move on to the second question. This will, we will start with uh, Amy Fee from the Progressive Conservative Party. What is your priority for Waterloo Region? Two-way, all-day go train service or high-speed rail? Also, what is your schedule for building and implementing this service? Again, to Amy Fee from the Progressive Conservatives. Thank you, Jeff, for that question. And absolutely, you can't go anywhere in this region and not hear about transit issues and gridlock and people wanting to be able to get to and from Toronto. So we are committed to two-way all-day go, and we want to get that service up and running as soon as possible. We know that we need to alleviate that pressure as well on the 401, and bringing that two-way all-day go to Kitchener will help to do that. We also want to continue on with the study that is ongoing now for high-speed rail and are committed to looking into that study um, and seeing where we need to go in the future. Thank you. So thank you. Now to uh, Sarika Shinoy from the Liberal Party. As a commuter to Toronto for nine years, uh, I understand what it means to be in traffic and take time away from your family. So there's no question in my mind, I'm a cheerleader for the GO train uh, coming here to Waterloo Region, and it was a delight to hear that we will be, the Transportation Minister made that announcement, that we will be having two-way all-day GO train uh, from Kitchener-Waterloo. But the other important thing was also of Cambridge. Cambridge uh, has a huge community that uh, uh, commutes to Toronto, and there was a recent announcement in partnership with the region of Waterloo, and the city of Cambridge, and the pro provincial government, and the liberal government, to indicate the feasibility study of having a GO train from Cambridge to hook up uh, to the uh, Kitchener-Waterloo-Guelph line. That is welcome news to alleviate some of the congestion on our 401, and to make sure that fa uh, co communities become closer and more opportunities open up for uh, uh, residents in all region. In, in this region, we have one of the best uh, uh, unemployment numbers right now in this region. But what I also hear from the chamber was there's a shortage of skilled labor right now. We, their businesses are not able to find uh, uh, employees. There's a 3,000 uh, 3, shortage of uh, skilled labor. Having all this uh, um, uh, go train, high speed rail, etc., will only make communities short, smaller and have more people, opportunities for people to come here and go the other way to Toronto or London. So those are welcome news and absolutely it's a priority for me. Thank you. Okay, now to David Weber from the Green Party. Thank you. The high-speed rail project is a good project. We've done a lot of studies in the past on this. We're kind of the king of doing studies here in Canada. And the, the concept is great, but the problem is, is that we haven't adequately built our infrastructure so that people can get within the community and then to the hubs. And then when you get to the other end of the line that you disembark from the high-speed rail and that it's integrated into intrust city and inner city from there, uh, from those hubs. So uh, my priority would be to see the all-day two-way go, but also we're neglecting places like Kitchener to Guelph, Cambridge to Guelph. I have a brother that for years has worked in Guelph, lives in Kitchener. That is totally without any public transit. We need better intercity connections like that. We also need to electrify our go. We need to do that to get towards 2050 where the Green Party wants us to be carbon neutral in all of our transportation. We're the only party that is that aggressive in wanting to be carbon neutral. Everybody's talking about reducing targets, uh, so much be uh, below 1990 levels, et cetera, 80%, whatever. Nobody is saying 100% or how they'll get there. The Green Party has the dedication to implement it and the plan of how to get there. Thank you. Okay, excellent. And now, uh, last on this question will be Fitzroy Vanderpool from the NDP. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, I believe the two-way all-day go transit is a very important project, and it's in the process of being um, implemented right now. Um, two-way all-day go uh, from Kitchener, Waterloo um, to Toronto to Niagara Falls. I mean, is important, but we, you know, we can't leave out places like uh, Cambridge and Guelph all these small towns because they're going to be a part of, uh, they can be a part to help um, with the cost of it all. 
Uh, but it's also important because, like I said, they're part of they're a part of our circle of what's going on. I think um, you know, like I said, for this we're looking to, um, along with the two way all day go, um, the NDP is looking to restore 50% uh, of municipal transit for improvements to services, and more affordable fares, and uh, you know, through uh, most of the infrastructure and construction that's going on, we can uh, create good jobs, good local jobs, and stimulate the economy. So I think it's a good thing right there. Thank you. Okay, so we now have a chance for rebuttal if anyone yeah, would choose I, I, to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. I just want to make sure that we know that the PC uh, party leader didn't want to, uh, said he would stop the uh, LRT in Hamilton, Niagara Falls. He would put a stop to all the uh, uh, rail uh, transit projects. I just want to make sure that is, um, uh, if uh, here my uh, colleague here says she's gonna do that, what would her position be with her party leader who has said he would not, uh, he would put a stop on that? Would he change his mind again or w what is the conversation? Thank you, Sharika. So we are absolutely committed to our LRT project in Cambridge. We are committed to bringing two-way all-day go to Kitchener. And as your MPP for Kitchener and South Hessler, I will definitely be one who will be advocating to make sure that we get a go train service to Cambridge as well, because we know that we need to be opening up the 401 and making sure that life is more easier for families who need to commute, but also to move goods on our 401 as well. And having that train service and the LRT service will just make our roads that much more open for goods to travel as well. Okay, thank you. I think we'll terminate the conversation on that question there. Um, we'll go on to the third question under the municipal uh, category. This question will begin with an answer from Sharika Shinoy from the Liberal Party. That question being, does your party support a basic income program in Ontario? If not, what reforms would you propose to the current Ontario Disability Support Program and Ontario Works? Sharika Shinoy from the Liberal Party. Thank you, Jeff, for the question. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the basic income uh, pro uh, program. Actually, the pilot is underway in four uh, areas, in Hamilton, Lindsay, um, uh, Brant County, and uh, uh, one more city I can't remember. But the four places, uh, the G uh, Ontario Liberal Party has already got the project underway, and we are w uh, waiting to hear. It's a three-year pr pilot project, and we are waiting to hear the uh, report back from the income project. The one thing I would say, the basic income is something which will help reduce poverty. It will be a one step in the right direction in our poverty reduction program. We need to make sure that uh, people ha don't have to worry about food or rent. This is something that will help reduce the stress. We want to address issues at a basic level, fundamental grassroots level. That's uh, food on the table, thinking about rent and prescription drugs. We have the right solution and the right strategy, the long-term vision of how to uh, uh, tackle poverty reduction. And this is what we are doing. So basic income uh, is a pro uh, project that the Liberal Party has already advocated. It's already in place in terms of what the re uh, we are hoping to get positive results out of that. That could put, um, that we could implement it, uh, implement the uh, solution uh, province-wide. This will help reduce mental health issues as well because these are the stress that it creates on families about not having in enough income uh, to put food on the table or pay for their rent. That is the other reason this Liberal Party introduced the $15 minimum wage, which actually lifted the uh, uh, people up to the living wage, which is $16. We are still below that. We are on a process to make sure that the living wage is the uh, minimum wage, but right now our party is, has implemented $14 minimum wage, and we are on the process of implementing $15 in uh, January of uh, 2019. This will help in all the process. We are talking about the basic income, the free prescription, uh, the um, uh, OHIP, Everything will be a, pr a step in the right direction to help alleviate the concerns of the working poor and the middle class. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now next to David Weber of the Green Party. The basic income guarantee is something that the Green Party has been advocating for a long time, and it is one of the things 
that attracted me to switch to the Greens after being a, a lifetime member of the Conservative Party. And uh, like most police officers, law and order, that's where we, we seem to put our roots. At least that's where we have. I know very many that have switched uh, away from that uh, because we see from policing how poverty and homelessness, lack of mental health care, drug addiction, also, uh, also often being self-medicating because of mental health being neglected. We've seen these problems not being addressed and how our not responding costs so much money. If we actually help people out of poverty with a universal basic income, a basic income guarantee, their health, everything improves. We've uh, seen it in some case studies here. We are doing one now that involves just Ontario Works and ODSP. If we would have expanded that project to include people such as single mothers staying at home that want to stay another year or two at taking care of their children, while their husband is maybe not making a, a, a large income, she would have the flexibility to stay home, or vice versa, all depending on who the, the person would be that is the primary bread earner, so to speak, out of the home. Um, the universal basic income would uh, reduce op uh, administration costs, dealing with different governmental programs, and it would benefit everyone, not just those that are working at precarious employment or low-wage jobs. The project should have been broader based. I'm curious to see how it pans out, but I do believe that it should be universal for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, David. And next to uh, Fitzroy Vanderpool from the NDP. Okay, so universal basic income is a very interesting one. I mean, because uh, with, uh, with one's income, it can, adopt, it can adjust uh, to their lifestyle uh, for affordable housing or you know, um, can lead them, you know, help uh, alleviate mental illnesses, all these things, uh, homelessness. I think that, um, you know, uh, one thing that uh, the, the NDP has been for over two years uh, working towards trying to get that, the minimum wage up to $15, which is still below a um, uh, good w wage of living. Uh, it's tough for a lot of families when, uh, you know, they've got uh, house rent to pay, uh, bills to pay, kids to raise. Uh, to try to get by on fifteen dollars uh, for an income. Small businesses are uh, are the backbone of the economy in Ontario, and uh, you know once we have the small businesses out there, and once they flourish, once small businesses flourish, uh, so will the economy. Uh, good way with that is to, like I said, uh, as we are uh, the NDP is working towards um, bringing the hydro back into the hands of the people, um, trying to get people to save 30% on the hydro bills. Um, that in itself will also help uh, small businesses because then they can uh, give small businesses a chance to, uh, to grow so they can have more employees, so we can have more workers in the field. Um, the NDP is looking to work with small businesses to create good jobs and support our local communities to build a more prosperous Ontario. Uh, small businesses contribute approximately 20% of Ontario's total GDP. So small businesses are the creators and they accumulate for 88% of net new jobs created in Canada between 2005 and 2015. So basically income is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Fitzroy. And finally on this question, no, we have a few more to go, I think. Uh, like I said, I'm losing track. Okay. Amy Fee from the Progressive Conservative Party. So thank you, Jeff, for the question and for bringing this up. And probably the number one thing I hear when I'm out door knocking is just how unaffordable life is getting for families in Kitchener South Hesfler. We know that families are struggling with everything from their hydro rates to their gas prices to just being able to put food on the table for their families. So the Ontario PC Party does support following through with this pilot project for the basic income project because we know how unaffordable life has become and how families are struggling. So we know that this is something that we need to look at and we are quite excited to see what comes of this pilot project. Okay, thank you. Um, and we began this question with Sarika um, and we'll now open it up to uh, rebuttals if there are. Uh, thank you. I, I like the fact that every party here says that uh, it was their idea and we implemented it and we put it into action. It shows the people uh, that our party, the Liberal Party, is open to suggestions 
and if they are good ideas, we will adapt them and we will impl implement them because it is about the people of Ontario, it is about the people of this uh, riding, it's about the people of this region that we need to remember. It's not party things, but what is right for you guys and for what is right for the people of Ontario. So I'm glad that all are on site with the power basic income guarantee. One of the things I will tell you when I go to doors is like the conversation I had with Diane, who said, why can't you? I, I know I get a subsidy from the government right now, but that's not enough for my rent. I b barely have enough for food on the table. Why can't you do something about it? And I told her, Diane, this is what we are doing. We have the basic income guarantee uh, pilot project going on. It's a three-year pilot, and we hope the results that are going to come. We need to make sure the Liberal Party always makes its strategic decisions. We need to make sure that this pilot actually serves the purpose for what we, have, uh, we want to achieve. And that pilot project is going on in four areas in the province. She was thrilled that the party was actually doing this, and uh, she appreciated the fact. So we are waiting to hear on the results of the three-year pilot, and hopefully if the results are good, we, we would have this, and it would remove a big concern of the working poor and the middle class. Thank you. Thank you, Srika. Uh, David Weaver. Thank you. After my turn, a few other things were brought up. I mentioned that I, I believe that this program should be broader than just Ontario Works and ODSP, and then some issues dealing with uh, employment and minimum wage came up, I just want to address. Raising the minimum wage is, is good. The problem with having raised the minimum wage without addressing it from a business perspective is that it's become quite a burden for some very small businesses. Uh, we have a situation where it's a, the equivalent of $20 an hour by the increased cost that small business has to pay in EI, WSIB, and CPP contributions. That becomes really unaffordable for businesses that have tight margins of profit. That's all the more reason why a universal basic income to eliminate people living in poverty and, and being stuck in precarious employment and being concerned with lower wages, it would just improve everything if we had a universal basic income. And then uh, the uh, competition between trying to be good to citizens by giving them a living wage with their employment is not at odds with actually taking care of small business and having them succeed, which uh, just the last point on that is that Right now, we haven't changed in 20 years the payroll exemption uh, tax or the health tax that the employee, uh, small businesses uh, are required to pay at. Right now, it's $5 million or less in payroll as a small business, and the NDP is looking at reducing that to $1.5 million. So in essence, if you have a business that has more than 15 employees, that business is going to be hit with essentially a 28% tax increase. All the more reason why we need to take care of small business and have a universal basic income. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, if we will be getting to more, um, there we have a uh, entire five question segment on the economy, so we can get to some of those questions. I'm sure they'll be addressed later. We'll move on to the next question now, still under the uh, municipal category. This will be first addressed by David Weber of the Green Party. Increasingly, employers across Waterloo Region, public and private, are concerned about rising housing costs and the impact of those costs on attracting skilled talent. How will your party address the rising costs of housing in Waterloo Region and Ontario? David Weber of the Green Party. Thank you. The, uh, the fact is we have more people waiting for affordable housing than are in it. With that being a crisis situation, we have to d deal with it as a crisis. The provincial government has downloaded to the municipalities the responsibility of bringing out affordable housing and for the most part running it, paying 45% of the cost associated with that. Municipalities do not have the money and the resources available to respond to such a magnitude of a housing crisis that we have. In order for us to address it, we need to legislate province-wide that all new housing construction will have 20% affordable housing that is below the uh, average cost of, of housing so that it is affordable 
by them doing this, building these projects and having cooperatives run them themselves with good quality homes built with, with not the substandard uh, materials that we often put into affordable housing, but build them well and then have them run by these cooperatives, the government doesn't have to be putting all the money in and it doesn't have to be running and monitoring all these programs meticulously. The, we can't do this with money from the government. We don't have enough of it to deal with that problem. We have to deal with it in a better way. And that is the Green Party's mandate that 20%, and that is a lot better than the 5% that we're trying to do with the government paying for it. But 20% of all new housing is affordable housing to address this issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up is Fitzroy Vanderpool of the New Democratic Party. Okay, affordable housing. Okay, Andrew Horvath and the NDP have a platform that takes action on housing affordably. We believe that safe and affordable housing is a right. 20% of Ontario renters spend over 30% of their income on housing, while the national average is only 13%. <clears throat> Astonishing, astonishingly, there are more families waiting for affordable, affordable housing than there are living in affordable housing. And Ontario also needs supported housing, which is crucial and critical in reducing homelessness and provides people with connections to other critical health services and support. Ontario has a critical shortage of the support of housing that lets people dealing with mental health challenges live independently while getting the support they need. So affordable housing affects a lot of things. It affects wage, how people live, where they live, what they can afford. So we need to, uh, you know, take a serious look at this and um, give it some serious thought. But affordable housing needs to be under control. Thank you. Thank you. Now to Amy Fee of the PC. Thanks, Jeff. So I believe in an Ontario that has affordable housing, that has housing for families to be able to raise their children in. For us, it's about increasing that supply. We know that we need to increase the supply to bring the costs down, and that means our provincial government needs to be open and working with our regions, our municipalities, and constructions and business teams to make sure that we can bring in that supply to bring the costs down. So that needs to be the focus for us, that we are working together to make sure that we do have that affordable housing for families and what a basic need that our families and our community need. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now to the Liberal Party, Sarika Shinoi. So the way to uh, what are we do? What is the Liberal Party doing in terms of uh, uh, helping or uh, reducing the rising cost of housing? We introduced the Fair Housing Plan. One of the things we did that was to make sure uh, uh, the rents don't go up. Uh, at, at the, it used to go up a lot, so we introduced the rent control that reduced the increases that landlords could do to 1.8% uh, annually. So that's one of the steps we took to uh, make it more affordable. The other thing we did to reduce the uh, hot um, uh, real estate market was to introduce the non-resident speculation ta uh, tax. This actually helped cool the uh, hot housing market to make it more affordable. We are also committed to having a co creating a cooperative housing development fund to support the creation of no, uh, new co-op housing. It, we are also trying to provide public land to build new uh, affordable and rental housing units. We are working with the municipalities and the region to uh, introduce um, uh, more housing units Units. We are also trying to boost the supply of rental and non-rental housing by improving the approval process and providing incentives to build new uh, housing, uh, new supply. So these are some of the things we are doing to make sure housing is, uh, is affordable uh, with the Fair Housing Plan. It's available on our platform, and I encourage uh, all of you to go check it out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're now into uh, the opportunity to have a rebuttal, if you so choose. If not, we will move on now into the uh, economy section of our debate here. All questions concerning the economy in Ontario and right here in Waterloo Region. Uh, the first question will go to Fitzroy Vanderpool of the NDP. Uh, question number one being, what is your party's position on minimum wage? Okay, thank you, Jeff. 
Um, my party, my party's position on minimum wage is we're we're for it. We're um, you know we think that it is, it'll give people a chance um, to earn a decent income to, in order to take care of their families. Um, you know, anything less than I mean, minimum fifteen dollars for minimum wage is, is less than uh, most people need to live on. So we're for that. Um, you know, we're looking to help hopefully up small businesses uh, contribute about twenty eight percent of Ontario's GDP. You know, we, we can create more small businesses in the community that will help uh, give people jobs and help the economy flourish. So we're all for uh, all for small businesses. Uh, the minimum wage, like I said, you know, it's going to de determine what kind of a housing or how people's lifestyles are, um, as how they conduct their lives, where they live, um, what they do, um, whether they're able to feed their families, and uh, you know, get get the things that they need, you know, get the medication they need if that's the case, if, if they have to pay for it. And I think that uh, that's important. You know, uh, summer's wage is very important what they make. Okay, thank you. Next to Amy Fee of the PC Party. Certainly over the last 15 years, life has become very unaffordable for families in our province. And we know that families need to be earning enough money to be able to pay their rents and put food on their table. So for us, that's why the Ontario PC Party is committed to removing all provincial income tax for people that are making a minimum wage. So if you're making less than $30,000 a year, we will remove that provincial income tax for you so that way you have more money in your pocket at the end of the year and it can make life a little easier to make ends meet and that is something that for me is a big passion of mine. I am here to support the community and make sure that people have what they need to have a bright future and a great community in Kitchener South Hespler. Thank you Amy. Now on to Sarika Shinoy of the Liberal Party. Um, the record shows that the Liberal Party cares about Ontarians and about the working poor. And that is why we introduced the $14 minimum wage, and we are on a path to implementing it to $15. The, uh, it's already legislated to go to $15 on January 1st, 2019. What Amy didn't tell you is that her leader, uh, Doug Ford, has said he would not allow the $15 minimum wage to go into effect next year. So that's something I, I also want to bring to attention, the fact that from 1995 to 2003, uh, uh, the minimum wage was frozen, and that was the PC government at that time. Since 2003 to today, we have had 11 minimum wage increases. If it wasn't for the concern and the care and compassion of this Liberal Party about all Ontarians, we would have been stuck at $6.80 minimum wage per hour. That is something I would say. Uh, to in today's at $14, we are still finding it difficult. I would ask, how would we have uh, how could we have managed at $6.80 per hour? Should uh, the PCs have been in power because they did freeze the minimum wage from for eight years, and they continue to say that they will roll back. So I just want to. Uh, reiterate the point. Liberal Party cares about all Ontarians, and we are on the right path to making sure that we uh, hopefully reach the living wage, which is at right now at $16 across the province. Okay, thank you. And finally, uh, David Weber from the Green Party. Experts in the accounting field uh, that is out of my area exper expertise have looked at the numbers and said that giving a tax break to individuals that already pay very low tax based on their low income are not going to benefit from that anywhere near as much as they would benefit from a pay. Uh, people lost their jobs. The unemployment numbers came out and the statistics came out in January which said we were at one of our lowest uh, unemployment rates in the region. Some people have lost jobs, but that does not mean they are not new jobs created. The small businesses have done certain things because they feared the on, um, backlash of this on their bottom line. But as the transition happens, I know they will come back and do the right thing of because it's employee uh, customer service that they're facing. If they cut jobs, uh, cut hours, it's a customer service, and that's something small businesses don't want to do. They uh, uh, it's important to provide the right customer service, and I believe it's a sudden jerk, knee-jerk reaction to the minimum wage, but they will be bringing back the employees. And it is something the businesses are doing. So I don't want um, uh, us to feel that the uh, Liberal Party did not understand the pain or the stress of this. And we have implemented many incentives to small businesses to cope with the transition. 
Okay, thank you. Would you like a rebuttal as well? Yes, okay, yeah. Fits right. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, minimum wage is an interesting thing. Um, you know, and and how much is you know enough for uh, for a family to to live and to get by on? I mean, like I said, we said uh, fifteen fifteen dollars an hour. Making fifteen dollars an hour is uh, difficult for some families to get by on, right? Just making fifteen dollars, they got to pay the rent, they got to pay their insurance, they got they got to feed the kids, and you know, yes, it can be tough, uh, difficult for fam for families to get by on that, especially when fifteen dollars is below the the minimum wage, uh, the wage of uh, living a decent lifestyle. Um, Twenty percent of Ontario renters, like you said, they spend over thirty percent of their income on housing. You know, while the while the national average is is only thirteen percent. You know, one of the things, like I said, the, uh, the new Democrats is looking to bring in is um, we want to bring in a free child care for uh, anybody making forty thousand or less, uh, and twelve dollars for for all others because child care is also you know uh, something that's very difficult um, you know to to pay. It gets expensive uh, when you. Out of the out of the bills monthly, so the minimum wage issue is uh, is a big one and it's an interesting topic. But I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. I think we'll uh, move on to the next question. Uh, this one, the answers will begin with uh, Sarika Shinoy of the Liberal Party. This question uh, is a little bit longer as well, so just make sure. <laughs> Maybe a little extra attention is it paid. Um, okay, so the question goes, for the past five years or longer, the Ontario government has informed its many transfer partners, such as post-secondary institutions, hospitals, municipalities, and other community service providers that restraint would be required until a provincial budget was balanced in 2018. Finance Minister Souza claimed the budget was balanced in 2017. However, he has now predicted deficits for the current fiscal year and for five to six years in the future. How does your party propose to address ongoing budgetary deficits in Ontario? And again, we'll begin with Sarika Shinoy of the Liberal Party. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, deficit, I had this conversation yesterday about deficits. We always have to make smart investment. We did balance the budget uh, this year, and if we wanted to just buy votes, like people have said with our, uh, some of our policies, we could have gone and just pretended that you know we don't want to do anything and carried on with the balanced budget for the next four years. We didn't do that. We do what's right. We believe in care, and we believe in compassion for all Ontarians. We wanted to make sure all Ontarians benefit from a thriving economy. The, uh, businesses are prospering. There's no, uh, it comes out in the record profits that we see in the markets. What we didn't see is all Ontarians benefiting from this, and that's why we introduced the uh, uh, OHEP Plus for uh, 25 and under, free tuition for students, uh, so that uh, they can go back, go to school and uh, uh, get the education they want to achieve their full potential. We also uh, in increase the minimum wage to help all Ontarians. Now when you do this, there is cost involved. Long-term strategies, you, uh, we look at long-term strategies. I always say be strategic in your implementation. No business does any of their uh, improvements without looking at the long-term vision of what their business wants to achieve. Similar concept is utilized by the Liberal Party when we do any of our investments. If that means we have to go into deficit, so be it. We are not afraid to take on deficit to make the, uh, to grow the economy, to help all on move forward. Our economy is doing so well. It's outpacing the G7. It's outpacing um, all the countries. And that is something we need to be very proud of. There's a shortage of labor in this region. We have to be proud of that, that you know, we, this region is creating jobs, is thriving in the, uh, it's the Silicon Valley of the North. It's all these positive things, but it still does not help the uh, common, uh, the minimum wage uh, earner there. And that is why we decided to implement the, uh, the boldest uh, progressive agenda in North America, I would say, with our policies. And if that means we have to go into deficit, yes, we, did, we are going into deficit. But we have a fully costed platform available to everyone to show that our plan, how do we uh, achieve a balanced budget in six years. So we have a path to success in terms of balancing the budget. It's not that we don't have a plan. Unlike my uh, our PC uh, 
uh, conservative party who haven't even put out a platform which is costed out. They make promises and we don't know where the deficit will be. And so does the NDP. They have uh, put a platform out, but they have holes in it. I just want us to know that our books are always open and have been open for the last uh, uh, 13 years to the public to make an assessment of are we doing the right thing. Obviously, the economy is doing very well. It means we are doing the right thing. Again, I say that this party is all about care and compassion for everyone, and that is why the next step we are taking is about moving forward with um, investments in people who actually can benefit from the thriving economy, and that's why we are going into deficit. Okay, thank you. Next to David Weber of the Green Party. Thank you. I had mentioned that in being a police officer, I had seen half of our time, half of our day, responding to homelessness, mental health issues, drug addiction issues, people that are in poverty. This costs an enormous amount of money. We have people that we are taking under the Mental Health Act because they're in stress, crisis, up to the hospital. They go through the admission process with the intake, the nurse, the doctor, psychiatrist that does not do a full evaluation but gets to the point of these people saying they're not suicidal. And we send them back out on the street and it's, we have some people, it's, it's costing a million dollars a year just to keep the status quo and not help them. That's, that's a lot of money wasted that we can actually be doing things on the front end to help people. This, this is an example of the many things that I see for wasted money. It's not that we don't have money. We can just reallocate it smarter. And that is exactly what the Green Party did with their budget, which is why when the other two budgets are looking at 11 to $13 billion in deficit, the Green Party is one-third that. And it looks at balancing the books in a few years. One of the ways we do that is we don't reinvest in the nuclear industry for $13 billion to rebuild Darlington, which the OPG has already said that if we rebuild Darlington, they're going to need to bill us 15.6 cents a kilowatt hour. That is going to triple our hydro rates or increase our debt and taxes. And the Liberals just made us a $60 billion debt by subsidizing expensive hydro, subsidizing it. And we want to continue on this path, apparently, if we elect the Liberals or the NDP that say they're going to continue to subsidize, the Conservatives that say they're going to keep the rates low, when they're all invested in nuclear, when we can expand the amount of hydro we import from Quebec, their hydroelectric dams at five cents a kilowatt hour, only as we need it, and then in the coming years, with the research and development that is rapidly coming into the renewable market, we can do more local projects here in Cambridge, in Kitchener, Toronto, and they're all going to be in the four and five cent range, I'm sure, based on what it is now. But the improvements will be made. Why would we lock into a 30-year contract after doing $13 billion in renovations to triple our hydro cost? It's that kind of mismanagement and waste of money that puts us in these positions. We need to be smarter about what we're doing and stop trying to cater and make the, the really rich people richer at the taxpayer expense. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now go to Fitzroy Vanderpool from the NDP. All right. You know, talking restraint and um, budgetary, uh, budgetary deficits, you know, all that comes down to, like, we got to support housing is crucial. Um, to reduce, reducing homelessness and provides people with connections to other critical health services and supports. If we have these supports in place for people, that can help uh, elim eliminate a lot of things before it gets to a, a position where it's um, crucial and it, it's, it's causing critical damage on the economy. You know, Ontario has a critical shortage of the support and housing it needs that lets people dealing with mental health challenges live independently while getting the, the support that they need. If we have these things in place, I mean, this all stems to housing, um, people's lifestyle. You know, um, you know, we got. I mean, we thankfully we, we have. Uh, you know, we're going to have a, a dental plan uh, coverage for all. Um, you know, healthcare where it is, but you know, um, like I said, it's it's all essential. I mean, just uh, the shortage of support uh, for housing. You know, um, dealing with homelessness, people's mental mental illnesses. We can all cut these things down if we can have things budgeted properly and we can create, get rid of the deficits 
in these issues, in these issues, these situations. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll go to uh, Amy Fee of the PC Party. Thank you, Jeff, for bringing this up. Certainly, the debt is one of those things that I hear about a lot at doors when I speak with families. They have that real concern of, what does this debt going to mean for my children and my children's futures? There has been so much waste in this province in the last 15 years, billions upon billions of dollars just wasted. I was a school board trustee. I certainly felt the pressures on our budget based on the restrictions put in by the Liberal government. For the Ontario PC Party, we are committed to working with our Auditor General, unlike the Liberals who have ignored what the Auditor General has said. Your books, Sharika, have certainly not been opened by your party, and you have been moving things off books to try and show that your, your budgets are balanced when they are in fact not. You're not listening to what the Auditor General says. Whereas an Ontario PC government will be committed to working with the Auditor General, to making sure that we have books that reflect what we are actually doing in our government, and that we go line by line to see what the Liberals have done for the last 15 years to find that money, so that way we can get that money into things like frontline health care, into our education system where it needs to be directly into our classrooms. That is what an Ontario PC government is committed to doing, to making sure that we respect your <coughs> tax dollars. Thank you. Okay, we'll now open up to rebuttal. Facts do matter. And I'll go to David um, from the Green Party and Amy from uh, the Conservative Party. Um, first of all, it was six, it's $6 billion in debt, not $13 uh, billion that we are talking about, about the deficit. Hydro rates uh, uh, is 5.9 cents per kilowatt hour versus 6.8 cents per kilowatt uh, watt hour for nuclear um, uh, generation. I need to um, reiterate water, as the Green Party rightfully believes in the environment, is an exhaustible resource. We need to preserve the most important commodity uh, on Earth, that is water. So we need to make sure uh, hydro is definitely cheap, uh, no, no one disagrees with that, but it is an exhaustible resource. Uh, resource. Now the conversation goes on about buying hydro from Quebec. We are already doing that. Whatever excess power they have, uh, Ontario does buy it. And when Ontario has high uh, hydro uh, and excess energy, uh, hydro, we are pa passing it. We are selling it to Quebec. The agreement right now exists, and there's about 160 million dollar exchange in revenues that goes on. I also want to talk about the Auditor General. It was the Liberal Party who set up the office of the Auditor General. And uh, I, I keep uh, reiterating this, have the conversation based on facts. Our books are absolutely open, and uh, our Auditor General did point out it's two different accounting practices. There's nothing more than that, and even businesses agree. There are different ways in which to, there's two different policy, uh, accounting practices that you can follow to do the books. We don't disagree what the Auditor General has said. We follow a different process, and the books are open for the public to see it. Unlike the PC government uh, speaks about uh, uh, us wasting money or increasing the debt. The last, uh, since the 1970s, there have been only seven balanced budgets. And out of that, four were done by the Liberal government, in, including this one. So I want everyone to figure out who is uh, a better manager of uh, fiscal, uh, or who has fiscal responsibility. It was the Mike Harris government where people know that teachers lost their job. I hear that we are concerned, but they, it was the same government, PC government, which cut uh, teachers in the schools and cut hospital care. It is also the same government which introduced the PC government, which introduced the Mike Harris government, which introduced the Energy Competition Act, which caused the hydro prices to go up. It wasn't the Liberal Party like the Green Party is implicating. When the Liberal governments took power, they saw that the prices were frozen because they didn't want uh, people to get upset. And we couldn't have a hydro selling to people. As a business owner, you guys know, we cannot sell below cost, so we had to op remove the freeze. And that is what the Energy Competition Act that was introduced by Mike Harris did. We are taking all measures to reduce the debt. 
And we can have, a, I'm sure there's a question on debt, how we are gonna manage the debt for future generations. And I'm willing to have that conversation if there is later on a question on debt. Uh, yeah, we might uh, be able to get to that okay. in a little bit, and we're going to have to move on uh, with uh, another rebuttal here from uh, David Weeper of the Green Party. Thank you. Mr. Noy, when you say that facts matter, they do. And I appreciate the fact that you admit that nuclear is more expensive than the hydro dam import energy from Quebec. But when I said that it is going to increase if the cost in nuclear, if we rebuild Darlington, which your party is inclined to do, the OPG has already applied, saying they're gonna be needing 15.6 cents a kilowatt hour. It's gonna be tripling the cost of hydro at source. Now you can continue to subsidize it when you've already made a $60 billion de uh, debt from subsidizing hydro in the past. It is not the prudent thing to do when there's a better option. And the hydro that we import can be a short-term measure as we then expand, as I said, in renewable energy projects so that we can get to that carbon neutral, totally 100% renewable energy here in Ontario that we need to do. Can I take that? Uh, is there, I think we'll have to, um, let's go with uh, Amy Fee next and then we'll get to uh, Fitzroy and then finally one last uh, reply and then we'll be moving on. Sure, I just want to go back to teachers in the classroom. It is your government now that have made it so that way when I was going into schools and talking with teachers who were beyond stressed out with what's going on in the classroom because they don't have the adequate supports that they need. We have heard from more than 9 out of 10 OECTA teachers, which is the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association, who have said that they have experienced or witnessed violence in the classroom. You're not supporting frontline workers. Let's go to doctors. I can't go anywhere in this city without hearing from a doctor who is telling me that our healthcare system is in absolute crisis in this province. You need to be getting your money into frontline healthcare. That's what about working with a budget means, is making sure that we are listening to our communities and listening to our frontline workers to figure out where that money needs to go and where our tax dollars need to be best spent. Okay, we'll have, uh, sorry, we'll have Fitzroy um, have a chance to rebuttal and then we'll go to Sarika and then we'll be moving on and we'll try to keep these uh, last few rebuttals uh, a little shorter on time. Thank you. Okay. okay, if we get into power, the NDP will listen to Ontario's Auditor General uh, and re respect the recommendations. This can help avoid waste and save money. These recommendations have not really been acted upon right now by the past government, but I will work with Andrew Horvath to implement these things. The Auditor General suggests us to ensure that money is spent properly and invest the savings into services. The NDP will bring a strong MPP code of conduct with regular updates in plain language so all Ontarians know what is expected of the people they elect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And finally, uh, Sreek, I'll give you about 30 seconds if you want to wrap up a few last points. For sure. We, uh, I just, um, first of all, we have invested in schools and we have renovated over 850 schools and uh, uh, opened up 800 new schools. Uh, so that's something we have done, believing in education. We believe in education, that's why we are introducing um, a mental health worker in every high school uh, moving forward. We believe in uh, special needs. That's why we are investing a record 2.1 billion so that uh, ch uh, there, there is more support with for teachers in uh, special needs classes. I also want to know why Amy couldn't come to the Ontario teachers uh, debate when we were there to hear their concerns. They want more help. There's no question in that and we recognize that. I would say having uh, to listen to your concerns is for the first step to understanding what the issue is. When uh, uh, we go there and we hear their concerns, they say you're, you're in the right step, you're doing in the right, uh, going in the right direction, we need a little more help. And okay. that's something we have already committed to in our budget. Thank you, $2.1 billion. Sorry, I'm going to have to just uh, stop this here in the uh, matter of time that we have. We are um, over halfway done and we still have a, a number of questions to go. So that being said, um, without trying to limit anything too much, uh, 
we could possibly shorten answers a little bit. Now will give us some more time for rebuttals, uh, but we are doing well, so we'll uh, keep on moving on uh, with this uh, debate, and we'll go on to question five. We will start with an answer from David Weber of the Green Party. The Greater KW, the Greater KW Chamber is proud to is proud to be a key partner of the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region. We know that employers seeking to hire immigrants and refugees to address labor market needs face challenges. There is a mismatch between the skills prioritized in the immigration system and workforce needed, needs in Waterloo Region, which negatively impacts immigrant hiring. If elected, are you committed to working with the Immigration Partnership and the business community to address this workforce gap? Again, we will start with David Weaver of the Green Party. I do feel like we've been a, a little bit long-winded on some of these answers. So in the interest of keeping this shorter, yes, I'm willing to work with them. I think it's very important that we have equivalency certifications uh, that are, are set in place and, and we know uh, maybe a little bit better in advance of what people's qualifications and skills are and what's accepted from what country when you're being an immigrant to the country. And uh, we, we need to marry up those skills. We, uh, we do have a, a program in place that uh, is supposed to help uh, in that process, but uh, not everybody is able to participate in it. If they did, and if you divided the money up equally, you're, you're looking at about 11 bucks support per person, and that's not really adequate. So we do need to make some improvements there. Thank you. Okay, now to Fitzroy Vanderpool of the NDP. Okay, um, I mean, it's, a, it's an important topic, uh, immigration and partnership, uh, because um, this uh, kitchener waterloo um, Hespler is a diverse uh, community, so we need to make sure that we welcome immigrants into the country, and we, uh, we keep everything so that they can learn, so they can adjust to, uh, to the community for, um, for, well, for housing, for schools, uh, for jobs, right? So it's only important that they get, they get a fair chance to also get a job and work and to uh, be productive in the community. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Amy Fee from the PC Party. I am absolutely committed to working with immigrants and immigration partnership in our community. We need to be working with our frontline businesses and making sure that we know where those gaps are and working together, and that's what about having an Ontario PC government is all about, is making sure that we have those conversations and those, the dialogue back and forth to make sure that we are supporting not only immigrants, but everyone in our community and our businesses. And that is something that, as an Ontario PC party, we are absolutely for. Thank you. Sarika Shinoy of the Liberal Party. I am an immigrant here. I came, 20, I, as I mentioned, I came 20, 28 years ago. So I understand the struggles new immigrants face uh, we have, the Liberal Party recognizes that. We have the Ontario Bridge Training Program that we have implemented so that people, when they come here, new immigrants, the immigrants, when they come here, there are a lot of them who are very qualified people but are unable to um, join the workforce whether it's language barriers, whether it's uh, certification, whether it's something else. So this is what the Liberal government has done, is the Ontario Bridge Training Program to help them transition into a new culture. I was a mentor at uh, TRIAC in Toronto when I worked there. That's to help new immigrants come in, to integrate them into the workforce. The cultures are different. It's sometimes it's minimal help that they need. The language is an issue, and we have ESL classes and uh, bridge training uh, classes for uh, new immigrants coming in. So there is a lot of um, uh, help uh, out there, but we need to do more. We also need to be aware immigrants come here with the intention, just like I came 28 years ago, to do a better, to in want a, a need of a better life. We work very hard. They work very hard, and they are a big contributing factor to the economy. So it's imperative that every government recognizes the need of immigrants and help them um, transition and settle smoothly into this new culture that we, uh, we and we welcome them. And that's what the Liberal Party is all about: care and compassion. Okay, thank you. We now have uh, an opportunity for rebuttal. If not, we can move on. I think we're going to move on to the uh, education uh, question here, and we do have uh, one or two other uh, economic related questions we can circle back to if we have time, but we want to get through some of these other topics, so we'll move on to education now. This question will be first answered by uh, Fitzroy Vanderpool of the NDP. 
The question is, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce passed a resolution in 2017 to end the Ontario College of Trades and examine other models of addressing the ongoing shortage of skilled trades in Ontario. Do you support the, um, sorry, do you support the uh, canceling of the Ontario College of Trades? And if not, how would you address this chronic skills shortage? And we'll begin with Fitzroy Vanderpool of the NDP. Um, let's see. I sure not. Uh, I think there's no real, um, no real issue there. I think it's uh, it's an okay uh, trade there. Can I? Yeah, actually, can, I, can you re repeat the last piece? Of it? Uh, yeah, I can repeat that question. Topic, yeah. um, again, from the beginning, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce passed a resolution to end the Ontario Colleges of Trades and examine other models of addressing the ongoing shortage skills, a uh, shortage of skilled trades in Ontario. Do you support this motion to um, end the Ontario College of Trades uh, in Ontario and how would you address this chronic skills sh shortage? Well, I think um, the, the um, College uh, Skills of Trade is, uh, is an important thing because it, it gives uh, gives these the students or people a chance to get educated so that they can get out there in the workforce so i don't really i'm not uh saying that i'm big on ending that because it's something that i mean the schooling is uh being able to, there's a lot of trades out there right now so if we're stopping these people from getting educated uh being able with a trade uh it's gonna be hard for them to get out there in the workforce to get a job um so yeah i think that i think that trades are trades are very important to help build the economy Okay, thank you. Amy Fee from the PC Party. The College of Trades is something that I've actually had to come up in conversations at doors um, with people who are looking for more so for that red tape to be removed and to make things easier. So the Ontario PC Party is absolutely for working on reducing that red tape in businesses that um, create such a problem. But also we need to be working with the Chamber and listening to the Chambers about what businesses truly need. So again, around the College of Trades and making sure that we are filling in that skills gap and making sure that we have quality employees that are ready to go out to work to fill in those gaps and that employers have an employee base to come from. So we need to make sure that we are working together to get the best quality workers that we can in our province. Thank you. Now to Sarika Shinoy of the Liberal Party. The Liberal uh, government and the party is working with the chamber and uh, other partners in the community, which includes the universities and colleges in recognizing the shortage of skilled labor and how do we um, address that uh, um, uh, shortage. So these are partnership conversations that are happening right now as we speak with uh, colleges and universities to align the needs of the local businesses with what should be offered. So that's one of the strategies that is uh, uh, um, um, taken over by the Liberal Party to make sure we address the issue. We, are also, we also have the Ontario Apprenticeship Strategy in terms of trying to align, and the Ontario Training Bank, a first of its kind, to align the needs of the businesses with uh, the uh, workforce that's out there. So these are some important steps that we are taking to address the shortage of uh, skilled labor and to address the needs of the small businesses. Okay, thank you. Now on to David Weber of the Green Party. One of the uh, hurdles that we need to overcome is the uh, inability we, we have right now in the system of matching up people that want to be apprentices and who's available to mentor them. We need to leverage the uh, Ontario uh, College Enrollment Service to help people get connected. Um, the uh, one uh, hurdle that the employer has for wanting to take on apprentices is that for six weeks of the year, for several years, someone that they're uh, training in the trades disappears to school. It's a lack of income to the business. Uh, it's a loss of money. Uh, we need to consider that perhaps one way of addressing that is, is a, a giving incentives to employers to actually mentor uh, the apprentice, uh, but perhaps maybe a less costly and equally beneficial way would be if someone is mentoring uh, and or sorry being an apprentice 
after they uh, become a journeyman, staying with that company for about the same length of time as what it took for them to become certified would be a way of guaranteeing to the, the business that it's worth their while in training people. Um, as it stands, we have people that get trained and then they get lured away to more lucrative businesses and the company and, and the mentors that have done all the hard work in getting you certified then have to start all over again. And, and that's not something that's overly appealing. So a lot of them, they're looking at bringing people in from, from foreign countries, you know, bring them over from Britain and stuff because we, we don't uh, have to deal with the training issues then and having the employee being gone doing training and then disappearing at the end of it. So that's something that I would like to see improved. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and we now have time for a rebuttal. If not, we will move on to questions about healthcare. And this question will first be addressed by Amy Fee of the PC Party. Question number one, quite simple, could you outline your party's position on pharmaceutical reform? Amy Fee. So certainly in our province, healthcare has turned into an absolute crisis. From all angles, our healthcare system needs a lot of work. When you talk to patients who are struggling to get into their doctors for wait times to fill their prescriptions. Then you talk to frontline workers, whether it's a PSW or a nurse or a doctor, they're talking about the issues that are happening every day for them. They're struggling to be able to support their patients. They're taking that home with them at the end of the day, knowing that their patient desperately needed their help and support, and yet they didn't have the resources that they needed to ensure that could happen. So for our party, we need to make sure that we get money into frontline health care, that we are working with our doctors, our nurses, and our PSWs to find out what is actually needed on the ground, that we also make sure that children under the age of 25 have the option to get their prescriptions. We need to make sure that we are making a health care system that is growing and vibrant again, that doesn't have eight 12 hour long waits in an ER because there's hallway healthcare going on, because there is nowhere to put someone in our hospital. We need to build our long-term care beds. We are promising to build 10,000 long-term care beds in the first five years, or 15,000 rather, and then 30,000 in the next 10 years. We know that this is a necessity for our province. We know that we need to get money back into frontline healthcare, and we know we need to end this healthcare crisis that is going on in our province. Thank you. On to Sarika Shinoy of the Liberal Party. Pharmaceutical care was the question, if I'm not mistaken. That, that is That's correct. Right. So we have already uh, introduced OHIP Plus for 25 and under to make sure everyone has uh, uh, the uh, access to uh, f of prescription drugs when they need it. We are also introducing PharmaCare for 65 plus. Uh, next year onwards, so that all seniors do not have to pay. They, uh, pharmacare is free for them right now, but what we are introducing is uh, they don't have to pay for the $100 uh, deductible that they need to do. They don't have to do the copay that uh, today they have to do. So that's a savings of $750 a year for a senior who needs that. So we are on the right track of introducing pharmacare for everyone. Our uh, leaders' policies of phar universal pharmacare here is something that the n federal government took upon and is now looking at a study to introduce universal pharmacare across the country. That is something this our party and our leader is not afraid to put forth bold uh, agendas so that we can all prosper. So that's our stance and our policy. We have already introduced pharmacare for 25 and under. We are in the process of introducing pharmacare for 65 plus. So we are on the right track of making sure everyone has access to prescription drugs. Okay, thank you. On to David Weber of the Green Party. Canada is the only OECD nation that has a health care system, like OHIP, that does not include pharmacare, the only one. When we're talking about a bold vision to bring this in, you know, the Green Party 
has been trying to advocate for this for pretty much 30 years now since its inception. We right now will treat you quickly if you have an emergent situation. If you have cancer, we'll deal with that. I have a niece who has a daughter with diabetes. We will half help, but a lot of the uh, assistive devices that people need or peripheral uh, to the medications requirements are being abandoned. And then it seems like anything above the uh, neck up when it comes to your eyes, your hearing, uh, your, it, it, your mental health, getting counseling and social uh, assistance for that uh, before a crisis situation, nobody cares. The Green Party wants to have mental health included in our healthcare system, as well as pharmacare and of course dental. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Now on to uh, Fitzroy Vanderpool of the NDP. All right, healthcare and pharmacare are uh, hot topics right now. I mean, right now, you know, basically we have the hospitals with lo a lot of overcrowding, uh, medicating uh, people in the hallways. And we want to try to alleviate those things because the, it shouldn't be like that. They should be, like I said, about 85% capacity for safe operating for hospitals. Um, you know, it, it would get difficult when you, if, if somebody, uh, you know, is in an emergency situation. One of the kids I spoke to at the schools there, they had, they broke their knee uh, wrestling and they had to get into the, into the hospital and they ended up waiting to like 12 hours to get that knee fixed, at, looked at and fixed. I mean, that, it shouldn't be like that. They shouldn't have to wait that long. So we need to uh, we need to end uh, end this. Get the hospital crisis back in uh, back in check. Um, dental care, like I said, the NDP is looking to have dental care covered for all for all, for everybody. So for universal dental care, um, I think that's very important. <clears throat> you know, we're looking to create uh, 2,000 new hospital beds and shorten surgery wait times. So these are some very important issues that we need to get looked at, and hopefully, you know, we'll get this in check very soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have an opportunity for rebuttal. If uh, we do want to take that up. Yes. We'll, okay, go ahead. I keep hearing, I get troubled when I hear uh, our healthcare system is in crisis. It is not. We have cha improvements to be done. We are investing in healthcare. We are, I'm not sure, I am very proud of OHIP. The fact that we can enter into a hospital or go access anyone, regardless of your financial stability or what your income is, that you can go in to any part of this province and have access to healthcare is something I'm very proud of. And it's also something Canada is very proud of. I, I cannot imagine not having OHIP uh, universal healthcare here. Hallway medicine, I, I, I keep hearing that. There is, uh, right now in Cambridge Memorial Hospital, we are just opening up a new wing. It costs money, and we are in the process of opening it up, and that will address the wait times for this region. We are also doing uh, other models, we are looking at other models of care, like telecare, virtual care, and we are trying to see what are the different models of care out there in the European countries that they use to see how we can benefit from them. We are a government and a party that's open to looking at new models of care as well. Uh, healthcare is not in crisis. We need to do more. I don't want us getting fearful that if I go into the hospital, I won't get care. That is absolutely not the case. We will get care. We are working on improving the um, uh, uh, healthcare system, and we are looking at how to make sure every person, whether it's through OHIP Plus, which is the question was on pharmacare, and I want to revert it back to the question that was asked. We are doing everything we can to help our uh, younger generation get access to Medicare, uh, prescription care, and to the 65 plus next year, and we are moving in the right direction and change takes time. We need to do things slowly so that we can make sure processes are implemented properly, not in haste or make hasty decisions without understanding the implications of what those actions are. We have, and we are continuing to invest in hospitals. We have three, 35 major uh, hospital builds going on in the province right now, and we are committed to uh, building 40 more in the next uh, mandate if we get that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we'll have David Weaver, 
Next from the Green Party, and after that, uh, Amy, you can finish off. I had mentioned that everybody looks at healthcare as just your physical body for the typical ailments, like a broken leg, you know, an illness like cancer. When we start to neglect the more chronic diseases, we don't talk about health promotion and prevention of illness, which we need to do. BC invests three times as much as Ontario does in that, and they have better outcomes. But we neglect our health to the point that we then rely more on medications, which is expensive, and also mental health. When you say our health care is not in crisis, I'm, when I know as a police officer half our time is spent dealing with mental health crisis and an exorbitant cost, dealing with the fact that we're not actually helping people with their mental health up front, that is part of our health care system. When I say that mental health care should be involved equally with our health care system as any other part of our health, and then to hear no mention of that and you just say there's no problem, uh, that causes me concern. Okay, Thank we'll you. move on to, uh, we'll have Amy Fee respond. So I just want to follow up with what David was saying there. Um, mental health is absolutely as important as any other type of health care that we have in our system, and that is why the Ontario PC Party is committed to putting $1.9 billion into mental health care. But going back to what Sharika is saying, it seems everywhere I go in our community, when I talk to doctors and nurses and PSWs, I am hearing that it is a crisis in our system. No matter what Sharika is saying, it is a crisis. They are struggling to keep up with the demands of the job. They are struggling to have the resources that they need to help their patients in a timely manner. There are wait lists galore in this province. And I heard from a family who had a loved one go into the ER at Cambridge Memorial. They spent eight hours sitting in a trauma room at Cambridge Memorial without a pillow. They continually asked for a pillow and were told by the nursing staff that they don't have one pillow per bed. This is not the kind of health care system that people in Ontario deserve. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Sreek will give you about uh, 30 seconds to wrap up this segment. The question was on pharmacare, and we were addressing pharmacare. Since it has moved on to mental health, this government and the Liberal Party is making the biggest investment of $2.1 billion into mental health. Mental health is a stigma that is out there, and it's important to have healthy conversation. That's why we have introduced the Open Minds, Healthy Minds uh, strategy, to have conversations about keeping uh, healthy uh, minds, uh, what it's uh, important to have those conversations, whether it's at home or at school or at the workplace. That's why this party is investing in a social, mental health social worker in every school to have those conversations. That is why the government has promised to introduce a counselor in uh, middle school as well. These are the things to tackle mental health issues. No one said mental health is not an issue. It's absolutely a big issue and we need to discuss that. We need to have open conversations and that's exactly what we are doing right now. I'm happy to see that we are having so many conversations about uh, mental health issues. We need to address that and we are doing all we can in terms of investing uh, $2.1 billion in addressing and cleaning up the process in how people can access. No matter which door they uh, knock on, we want to make sure this Liberal Party wants to make sure that when a person is calling with mental health issues, okay. they knock on a door, uh, that they have a person right there to address uh, those Sarika, concerns. We're going to have to, um, apologies again, but uh, due to time, we're going to have to move on to the uh, next question, still in health care. And this one will be uh, addressed to, uh, to Sarika. You'll be beginning with this question. Um, the question goes as follows. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce has identified mental health uh, support in the workplace as a priority issue. What specifically does your party propose for workplace mental health? And I guess we'll uh, begin where we left off. Sarika, you can uh, continue with this answer. Mental health is absolutely, um, as I said, we, ha we are the Liberal Party is investing $2.1 billion in uh, tackling mental health. And one of the first things is uh, my conversation with the Chamber was 
we have to tackle mental health issues at the workplace too. What are the reasons, uh, what are the causes? It's important to tackle it at the grassroots rather than when a person comes, uh, is a mature adult. Today, we are tackling it at a mature adult um, uh, when they come into the work, uh, workforce. Uh, mental health issues are cause a lot of loss of productivity at the workplace. That's something we recognize and businesses recognize and that's why it's important to have these conversations. Again, I mentioned about the open minds, healthy minds strategy. We need to have these conversations. We want to address them at a, at a grassroots level where children are comfortable coming forward and having those conversations. That's why the Liberal Party is investing in a so, mental health social worker in the school so that children can have this conversation before they uh, become mature. We are also introducing something else very basic, is the affordability uh, of making sure people have food on the table and money to pay for rent. It, mental, I personally believe mental health issues start at a very primary stage when the stress in the family is high whether they can have food on the table, whether they can buy prescription drugs, or whether they can pay rent. All of these measures are something, like I say, it's the boldest progressive platform that a, a party has put forward in all of North America through the minimum wage increase, through the OHIP plus, so that uh, people don't have to worry through the basic income uh, guarantee uh, pilot project that's out there, through the um, free tuition, making sure all these uh, issues which a family struggles, at, not to the wealthy, but to the uh, person, the working poor, these are big pro uh, issues. These are the ones which are the primary causes for mental health. We want to tackle them at a, at a primary stage so that when b they graduate or they come into the workforce, businesses don't have to deal with it or people don't have to uh, face those uh, sick days at work. These are uh, productive hours that could, uh, could be, uh, are being lost today and could be regained by addressing the mental health issue. We are investing $2.1 billion in mental health to re, uh, restructure the mental health, how people can access that. So these are important steps in addressing mental health issues, and we are working with all businesses and partners to address this. Okay, thank you. Now to uh, David Weber of the Green Party. Thank you. Uh, dealing with mental health uh, supports in the workplace, uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are various stressors in every workplace and people can have mental health uh, issues that aren't directly work related but they bring them to work and maybe work exacerbates the issues. But uh, my experience in policing and being familiar with uh, personnel in um, the uh, ambulance and paramedics and firefighters um, this, the, I've seen a lot of people that have struff, uh, suffered PTSD type related issues, uh, if not outright PTSD, but uh, a syndrome similar to that. And one thing that I would like to see is a mandatory uh, review of critical incident uh, debriefings uh, with involved uh, officers or emergency responders when, when it comes to the more serious than normal calls in their, in their routine. And uh, I know that there's no such thing as a routine call in many of these jobs, but some of them do strike you more when you deal with a dying elderly person that reminds you of your grandmother, or you see someone in pain and agony and he looks like your dad that you lost two years ago. To not have your supervisor who is aware of these things in your life to consult with you and talk with you and give you support and encouragement to reach out and get the help you need and let them know that they're there for you and the services are there for you. I think this is really sad. We're starting to talk about this. It needs to happen, I think, in more workplaces than just the emergency services, but uh, I see it very much there. And um, I, I, if we had mental health included in our health care system, that would go a long way. But employers need to help make it affordable when we don't have the government stepping up and doing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Fitzroy Vanderpool from the NDP. I think that uh, mental health is a, is a major priority um, in this economy. I think that it's important if we have a, it, it affects affordable housing, um, living, uh, education. What we need to have is uh, 
groups and shelters out there that people can come to for support so that they can work through these issues. Um, you know, because mental health is something that, you know, to deal with it on your own is very difficult. So if we have, the, if, if we have those um, groups and shelters in place to help people being able to deal with those things, then that's a critical part of uh, the mental health issue and how we can develop and, and tackle those challenges to stop that from becoming a situation more than what it is. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Amy Fee from the PC Party. Well, Jeff, thank you for bringing mental health up because it is something that is so important in our community. It's not only important in our workplaces, but in our community as a whole. And as a school board trustee, I saw it when I would meet with teachers, when I would meet with students, even in the hallway, and you would hear the stories about their day, and you could see kind of that stress building up within them. Mental health needs to be something where we're open and we're talking about it. And that's why at the Catholic School Board, I was part of the program that brought in the Elephant in the Room program. So we could talk about mental health and bring up those stories and make sure that children were well aware that they, it's a safe place to come talk about how you are feeling. And that is why I am proud to be running for the Ontario PC Party when we are committing $1.9 billion into mental health initiatives. And some of that money will flow right into our school boards to make sure we are helping our students and making sure that we are building bright, healthy communities and for our future generations to come. And on top of that $1.9 billion, we will also have the money from the federal government as well for mental health, which will bring that initiative up to $3.8 billion. So for me, absolutely, mental health is so key and so vital to ensuring that we have a wonderful Kitchener South Hespler. Okay, thank you. We now have the uh, opportunity for rebuttal. Uh, just to add on, besides that, uh, the Liberal Party is also investing in youth activity centers so that we are uh, committed to and we are, have introduced. Uh, we plan to uh, introduce uh, 40 more youth activity hub centers where children can come and uh, have conversation in safe places. These are environments we need to encourage and we need to do that. So the qu question for small businesses is we need to encourage healthy conversations, open conversations, and I believe uh, the Liberal Party is committed to having these conversations with the open minds, healthy minds uh, strategy. Okay, excellent. Um, just to give us a little time frame here, we have about uh, seven or eight more minutes before we'll get into our, our closing remarks. So we have a question here uh, about accountability and transparency. Each party makes campaign commitments. When a promise is broken, the electorate is understandably frustrated. If you are part of the governing party and your government breaks a commitment, how would you expect your leader to handle it? As importantly, how would you respond as an MPP? And this, we will begin with uh, David Weber of the Green Party. Thank you. As for the first part, what would I expect to my leader? I would expect honesty and, and integrity. And uh, that is exactly what I see in Mike Schreiner. Uh, even though the media consortium did not see fit to include him in the leaders debate, so you didn't see him speak. Uh, if you get to know Mike, investigate him online, get to know him in person. He's in Guelph every day from 12 to 1. You can have lunch at his office, bring your brown bag lunch. You'll get to know very quickly who he is as a person. The reason why I got into policing is because I wanted to be fair and I wanted to see justice done. I will always stand up for what is right, even when it's by joining a Green Party, which is a distant fourth, and it is a long shot in order to actually be able to get in and make a difference. But it's my values that align with the party, the basic principles of participatory, sorry, participatory democracy, diversity, inclusion, social justice, sustainability, nonviolence. We focus on jobs to people and the planet equally because if you don't value all three of those and make your decisions based on those three, nothing thrives. So I will stand by my values to fight for an economy that thrives in an environment that doesn't destroy its biodiversity and that we can live sustainably in the future with healthy individuals being given the supports they need to thrive, both mentally, physically, et cetera. Um, I will advocate for you 
and I will make sure that the elected individuals in whatever government is formed are accountable, and I will be accountable to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now to uh, Fitzroy Vanderpool from the NDP. Okay, I think um, you said for myself, I, work, I will work with Andrew Horvath, uh, the NDP, to, um, to implement one of the, the Auditor General's suggestions to ensure the money is spent properly. Uh, invest the savings into services. The NDP will bring a strong MPP code of conduct with regular updates in plain language so all Ontarians know what is to be expected of the people they elect. The NDP will eliminate costs for freedom of information and, you know, as you know, the media plays a critical role in our democracy by keeping government accountable for its errors. So citizens will have the right to know what their government is doing. So we'll have every, everything transparent. Absolutely. Okay, and next to uh, Amy Fee of the PC Party. One of the reasons why I'm here running for the Ontario PC Party is because of how frustrated I became over the last 15 years with the lack of transparency that was in this Liberal government, the lack of respect that was there for your tax dollars. So one thing that you can count on with me as your MPP for Kitchener South Hespler is that I will respect your tax dollars, that I believe in an Ontario that is inclusive for families and inclusive for people with special needs. I've already been a strong voice within the Ontario PC Party and at Queen's Park advocating for people in our community and advocating for people with developmental disabilities. The reason why the Ontario PC Party made an announcement and made such a big commitment to children with autism is because I have been that strong voice within the party. I pushed and talked and it brought our stories to Queen's Park with what was going on with cuts that were made to funding for children with autism. Two years ago at Queen's Park, I stood with families who had what they felt was like their children's futures ripped from them when the Liberal government decided to cut autism funding for children over the age of five. When the Ontario PC party pressed, that funding was restored. And now on the weekend, I announced that the Ontario PC party, when we form government in June, will invest another $100 million into autism therapy funding for children up to the age of 18. This funding absolutely works. I am absolutely a strong voice for Kitchener South Hespler, and I will be held accountable by you, by you coming to speak with me and making sure that I am doing what you need me to do to represent Kitchener South Hespler at Queen's Park. Thank you. Okay, and now to uh, Srika Shinoy of the Liberal Party. Accountability is all about uh, being there in front of you and listening to your concerns and addressing them. That is the first thing in terms of accountability. I have been going to several debates and listening to people. Even when the going is tough, I don't get scared. I stand there and I listen to the conversations and I try to address them to the best of my ability. If I can't, I make sure I address, I pass on the concern to the person who can help them. I have stood for what is right. That's my record and my uh, 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 performance in the community. I have stood for a fair and inclusive society. I have fought for what's right and making sure everyone belongs and everyone has the right to a fair and inclusive society, a share of the economy that everyone can participate equally in from this diverse culture. At the same time, accountability also means you've got to listen to what the concerns are, have an open mind and address them, not just not be present or not listen to them. You have to have your books open. Our books are open. I keep saying that. It's not a false statement. You can check the books. Our budgets are there. Our platform is there versus the uh, PC platform, which is not there. Nobody knows what the end results of all the promises are. Is that an intentional uh, a strategy to not uh, provide the platform or the fully costed platform, what the cost might be? Could be billions of dollars of cuts. You cannot reduce taxes. You cannot uh, say, uh, like their leader said, 10 cents of the gas tax. You cannot say, I will reduce taxes and not charge taxes. I will reduce the hydro. How are you going to reduce the taxes? The revenue taxes are the only form of revenue for a government. 
I need to understand how does the PC government, uh, if they come on June 7, will, will they show, be upfront right now and provide that transparency to the people of this region, to the people of Ontario? Coming to transparency again, it's all available for you to do. I'm very transparent about what I do. I am an open book. I listen to people, what I can do. I'm always there. I stand up for what's right. I'm known for that. It's my personal integrity that I ma it matters most to me. I will be your voice, and I will always stand up for what's right. That's who I am, and I'm not afraid to speak up. I'm not afraid to ask. Just yesterday, I asked the Minister of Finance who was there at an event. I asked him about the questions of deficit and debt. So I was hoping that we could have a conversation on that, because it was a very enlightening conversation on what the facts are. I believe in facts. That's the way I grew up, talking to facts and not making up stories. That's who I am, a person of integrity. Okay, thank you. Um, just due to time constraints now, we'll get into the uh, closing remark, if that's okay. Um, we will get into that. So we now have a uh, one minute for closing remarks, we're gonna, gonna go in reverse order that we started in, so we'll start uh, at the end of the table with uh, Sarika Shinoy of the Liberal Parties. Just again, uh, one minute for closing remarks. Hi, I'm again Sarika Shinoy, your Liberal candidate for the riding of Kitchener, South Hespler. I'm troubled by the rhetoric out there in the public saying that a Liberal Party is not do is uh, a mess, it's, um, uh, this system is in crisis, people are um, uh, not able to afford, my conversations at the door are different. They are happy with the progress we have made. Our economy, based on facts, these are facts, I'm not making up these stories. Uh, economy is at an all-time high. Our GDP is uh, outpacing the G7. Unemployment in Ontario is at its lowest in 17 years. Our region of Waterloo's unemployment is at an all-time low at 4.9% uh, in the last 20 years. These are good st uh, statistics to have. These are important stats to have. We, and I, we are trying to build up on that by providing care and compassion for all Ontarians. We are raised the minimum wage to help all the middle class and the working poor. We are introducing OHIP Plus for 25 and under, and we want to uh, provide OHIP Plus for seniors too. We have introduced free tuition, because of which 235,000 students have gone back to school and are able to pursue a dream that they too can have. We have introduced, uh, uh, we want to introduce child, uh, free childcare. We have introduced full day uh, kindergarten because of which families like you, mine, I didn't uh, have this opportunity, but uh, uh, save $6,500 a year. So these are important things. It's important for you to know about care and compassion of this party over cuts. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now go to Amy Fee of the Progressive Conservative Party. First off, thank you, Jeff, for being here and moderating for us today, and for all of you watching and taking the time to get to know your candidates. I've certainly clearly heard from people across our community that the voters of Kitchener South Hespler have a very important choice to make. We can choose to elect a Liberal or an NDP government who have both committed to adding billions of dollars to our massive deficit. It's just going to simply result in higher taxes for Ontario families, something we've already established they just cannot afford. Or you can choose an Ontario PC party government that will bring real change and relief for hardworking families across our province, and we'll focus on cutting your hydro rates, cutting your taxes, and making life more affordable creating good paying jobs here in Ontario by working with businesses, ending our hallway health care, and finally restoring that trust and accountability that is so desperately needed in Ontario's government. An Ontario PC party government is the only government that is committing to putting money back into your pockets and making Ontario a place that is open for business again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now go to Fitzroy Vanderpool of the NDP. My name is Fitzroy Vanderpool, and I'm running for uh, MPP for the NDP for the Kitchener South Hesper. Um, I've been a born fighter, been a fighter all my life, and I'm willing to fight for the people of Kitchener South Hesper for what they want, for what they need. Bring me your concerns, and I will be the voice. You know, I know that um, one thing that I would like to ask to see is the plan by the PCs. 
They have no plan. They have, they have not put their plan on the table. They have not showed us what they want to do. The polls have been open for two days already, and people have told me they have not yet seen what Doug Ford is going to do, how he is going to cut all this money that he puts out. On, he says he's gonna, going to cut. Um, it would be nice to see that. Like I said, we are, we're working towards um, pharmacare, health care, and dental for all, and we want equality. We are working for the middle class and the low-income families. So I thank you, and I look forward to your support June 7th. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now lastly, uh, David Weber of the Green Party. I keep hearing people say, I can't vote for Doug Ford. I can't vote for Kathleen Wynne. I can't support Andrea. None of them are running in Kitchener South Hespler. When we say comments like, I can't vote for that party, what you're saying is you don't care about your local candidate. What you're saying is you're admitting that the local candidate in these political parties' views is nothing but a puppet to serve at the will of their elected leader. That is not what you will have with me. No matter which government is elected, because one of those three is probably going to win, to elect a green MPP with integrity and honesty and that will be an advocate for your best interest and to hold their toes to the fire for whatever government is in play, nothing will improve your government in Ontario more than that. I, David Weber, am asking you for your vote on June 7th because one can make a difference. We elected two in PEI and they are now polling high enough to possibly win in the next election. And that is because you gave them a chance in PEI. I want you here in Ontario to give me a chance. We can make history. It's up to you to vote for something rather than vote for something you don't really like to avoid something you hate. That is not how we get the best government. It's by electing the best candidates. And by electing the best candidates, you will get the best government. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And that concludes uh, the debate here on behalf of the Chamber and Rogers. I want to thank all our candidates for taking their time. I know I uh, can appreciate how busy you are all in these next uh, 10 days and have been for the last uh, several months. Uh, it, was a, it was a great, lively debate, respectful debate. So thank you for taking part. I would also like to thank the Waterloo Police Association for hosting us here at this uh, wonderful venue. And of course, thanks to the community for your attendance and watching on Rogers Cable 20. If you are a resident of Kitchener South Hespler, the, the election date is rapidly approaching, so please be sure you are aware of your voting location. The Chamber and Rogers hopes this form has provided some relevant perspectives to you on the issues of your concern. Uh, thank you all once again uh, for making it out. Thank you everyone for watching again. Thank you for the candidates. We will be continuing with our series of uh, debates going on all this week leading in to the June 7th election. Once again, thank you. Uh, and on behalf of 570 News, I'm Jeff Pickle, and it's been a pleasure of mine uh, for hosting here this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Due to the length of the preceding program, we now join the regularly scheduled program already in progress.
Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Educational. And this is a combination smoke and carbon dioxide alarm. Thought provoking. To write the book you really are meant to write, you first have to become the person who's meant to write that book. And fun. Oh, goodbye. This is so advanced. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not successful. Oh my gosh, shooting. <laughs> Natasha McKenty interviews people from around the region about what's happening in your own backyard. In studio, Mondays at 1 p.m. on Rogers TV. Rules of the road help everyone avoid collisions on the water. As a powerboater, 